Investors are kind of obsessed with gold, but given the lack in volatility and success in positions, it's given it a bad rap. Well, we have gathered the finest panel to sort it all out for us. So I'd like to introduce you. And guys, I have to say, I am surprised we pulled this off having lunch at Delmonico's, the most iconic restaurant here right in the financial district. Let's get it going. We have Douglas Borthwick, currency expert, Stephen Sarge Gilfoyle of Sarge 986 and my co-host on Street Smarts. Of course, we all know Jim Rickards. He is the editor of Strategic Intelligence and Dave Williams, the ultimate gold guy of Strategic Gold. Gentlemen, nice to have you on the show. Good, good to be here. Our pleasure to be here. All right. So technically speaking, gold has been in a downtrend since May of 2018. It hit a uh, recent low of 1167.10, and it seems to be consolidating around 1200. So are we going to retest the lows, or do we have the low in, and we're going to move higher? Well, the, the thing about uh, analyzing gold vases, is you're right, it is down since uh, earlier this year. But I think you need to widen the aperture a little bit and just take a longer perspective. And, and I think investors in general, their attention spans are way too short. You know, they buy something on a Monday, it goes down on Tuesday, they're like, oh, that was idiotic. Well, no, it might be going up on Wednesday. You just need to, again, take a little longer perspective. Now, from 1999 to 2011, we had one of the greatest bull markets in history in gold. It went up 750%. From 2011 to 2015, we had an intense bear market in gold. It went down 50%. And that's not unusual in commodities. They don't go to the moon without some kind of significant reversal, and that's what we had. It looks like there's an interim low in December 2015, which was interesting. That was the exact liftoff date. That's when Janet Yellen raised interest rates for the first time in nine years. And gold took off from there. Today, it's up 15%. Now, is it down from March? Yes. But from that bottom, from that interim bottom, it's up 15%. It looks like we're in a new bull market for gold that I expect to go many years into the future. So I don't get too discouraged when it's down overnight. I don't get too euphoric when it's up overnight. I just say, um, okay, look at the trend, look at the slightly larger picture. It looks like we hit a low in December 2015 and it's going to go a lot higher from there. Well, as a trader, yeah, I look, I look at 1205 as something of a, of a, of a swinging gateway. Uh, I see the range is 1150, 1160-ish, up to about 1250. I see that is the tradable range. You, you, either, you either want to jump on it as it goes above 1205 or sell it as it goes below 1205. And, and those would be your target prices on, on either end. Now, I'm not speaking as an investor. That, that's up to these fellows here. But as someone just trading gold based on the physical price, because you're going to trade the futures or the ETF, but you're probably going to base, trade them based, at least from my thinking, on the physical price, because the physical price is much more important. I look at gold sort of like I do with uh, currencies, and gold is always to me like an inflation hedge. Now, traditionally, you've got, if there's inflation in the U.S., you'd expect gold to start jumping because everyone's trying to save the value of their money. And, and what's really interesting in this market right now is you've got the Fed raising rates, so stifling inflation, theoretically. But at the same time, you're not seeing gold rally. But what you're not seeing is you're not seeing gold collapse. And you're also not seeing it in dollar terms. You're not seeing the dollar start to rally from these levels. Instead, the dollar sort of stabilized and looks like, if anything, it's going to start going lower. And so what I find really interesting is when you talk about a bottoming in gold, I think you can also look at a topping in the dollar in this current cycle. Because no matter how much the Fed seems to be raising rates, no matter how much the Fed seems to be reducing its balance sheet, Gold isn't collapsing, and the dollar isn't strengthening. And so for that matter, I think that no matter what the government's throwing at it, no matter that there's no inflation, it seems to me that you're, look, you're looking at a bottoming cycle in gold, and you're looking at a topping cycle in the dollar. So we have a, I, I agree with what's been said around the table. <clears throat> From our perspective at Strategic Gold, uh, the gold prices are set in the paper gold market. The paper gold market is is multiple multiple times larger than the or actual the physical gold market, um, to, in somewhere in the order of uh, 400 to 500 times more papers traded than physical. So, so that market controls the price of the physical. So, it, and that and it depends on the float, and we can get into that later. So, when you're talking about what happened between May and now, um, paper gold was sold. That doesn't mean physical gold was sold. Uh, in fact, I believe that physical gold was bought. So, so 
when um, these gyrations occur in the gold market, it, it all has to do with traders like, like Steve. It has to do with, with FX. It has to do with other currencies. It has to do, but it's very, very short term. And, and to Jim's point, gold is a, is a long term asset. Gold is money. So if, if you want to hold gold, you hold gold as a, as central banks do, as a reserve asset. You don't hold gold to buy it in May and sell it in, in June. You don't hold it to buy it in May and sell it in October. If you're a gold owner, a physical gold owner, you buy it to hold a wealth asset. Yeah, I agree with that. Let's just expand on that a little bit because there are physical gold players, big ones. Russia and China. Russia has tripled its gold reserves in the last 10 years. Right. China has tripled its gold reserves in the last 10 years. It's not easy to do that without market impact. Gold is a funny thing. It's liquid. Whenever you want to buy it or sell it, the market's there. I've never seen the market shut. But it's thinly traded. Usually things that are thinly traded are not that liquid. But gold is liquid and thinly traded, which means you can have a big market impact if you're out to buy 30 tons. Now, Russia has been buying between 10 and 30 tons for 10 years. How do you do that without skyrocketing the price of gold? The answer is they, give, they have a network of dealers, they give standing orders, they say, you know, don't disrupt the market, just keep shooting it in. Russia's reserves went from approximately $500 billion to $300 billion from 2015 to 2016 when the price of oil collapsed. They never sold an ounce of gold. They kept buying. They sold treasuries, they sold euros, they sold whatever they needed to sell. But they continued to buy gold as their reserves went down, which says something about their dedication to gold. Now, let's just combine those two things, the physical gold market that we just talked about and the paper gold market. And I agree with you. This is manipulated like crazy. And even if it's not manipulated, the hedge funds, they don't care if it's soybeans, coffee, or gold. To them, it's just a trade. But if you were China, you would want to use the paper market to suppress the price while you continue to buy the physical. So I look at that and say, just buy the physical. You're, you're free riding on China's manipulation. Do we know what China's been doing? Because they don't report like everyone else, right? They report, uh, they used to not report at all. Now they report periodically. They're not transparent. Whenever, so, they, feel yeah, like whenever they feel like it. So they'll, they'll say, oh, our gold reserves just went up 300 tons. Well, it's not like they went out the night before and bought 300 tons. We know that didn't happen. They acquire it all the time, and then they report when they feel like it. But the other thing that's not well known, they have two, uh, really three sovereign wealth funds. There's the People's Bank of China, which is a central bank. There's a China Investment Corporation, which is a sovereign wealth fund. And then there's something called SAFE, State Administration of Foreign Exchange. That's where the money is. It's run by an ex-PIMCO guy. They're very savvy. All the foreign exchange trading, all the treasury trading, they do it in SAFE. And then every now and then they'll flip it to the central bank when they feel like it, and the central bank will update their reports. But we don't know what's going on inside SAFE. Now, the, the only source of information, the Swiss are fairly transparent, so we can see Swiss exports to Hong Kong and Shanghai. We can see Hong Kong exports to China. We know from geological surveys approximately how much mining uh, China is doing, uh, about 450, 500 tons a year. So you can put this information together and you can see 1,000 or more tons a year going into China or taken indigenously. Uh, what you don't know is how much is private and how much is government. So I just do 50-50 in the absence of better information. So we, you really have to struggle to approximate it. But we do, we do know a few things. Yeah. And the U.S. only holds, what, 8,000? 8,000. 8,000. So we were small. So the, well, we're, we're, the we're the biggest. Biggest single holder. Single holder. Down from Did, what, though? We're down, I mean, was well, it 20, 25? We were 20,000 tons Back in 1950. In the, so yeah. we're down a lot. But what's interesting is if you take all the members of the Eurozone, uh, so Germany has 3,000, France has 2,000, yes. Italy has 2,000, round numbers. If you combine them, it comes to 10,000 tons. And the euro itself, and the, and the, euro and the itself. ECB itself. Right, so the, so the ECB has some goals. So if you, if you take the whole eurozone combined, they have 10,000 tons. Gentlemen, why? Why, when we broke a, a, away from the gold standard, are countries building their reserves in gold? You know, this may be a breakaway from the dollar standard. And one thing that's very, very interesting about this administration that's different from others is for the first time, the U.S. Treasury's talked about using SWIFT as a weapon. Now, SWIFT is essentially the way that you can trade dollars around the world. If you're cut off from SWIFT as a sovereign country, you're cut off from the dollar and you need to find other ways of doing financing. Now, certainly, you know, places like China now are doing an oil contract in Chinese currency. You've also have all of these central banks in emerging markets and in countries that are having difficulties with the U.S. start to buy gold aggressively, you know, and they're getting out of U.S. treasuries. And so what you're seeing here is maybe this gold, this dollar standard that replaced the gold standard now slowly start to dissipate as the U.S. starts to look at the dollar as being a weapon. 
Does that create an opportunity for the Bitcoin crowd or the, the crypto crowd? I think crypto is completely irrelevant to all of this because I think that the holders of, of crypto or the holders of Bitcoin really have very little understanding of what's going on in a macro environment. They're buying it because they see that's the future for a technology, as opposed to folks buying and selling dollars, buying and selling gold, do that because they see this is the future of macroeconomics. And I think they're both very, very separate issues. Do either one of you have an opinion on Bitcoin? Because a lot of the younger crowd, not Bitcoin, but crypto in general, a lot of the young, younger crowd sees that as a replacement for gold. Guilty. I think it's hard to say crypto in general, other than the uh, technology of the digital distributed ledger. But there are, last time I looked, 1,600 separate cryptocurrencies listed on major exchanges. And some of them are tiny and some of them are frauds, no doubt about it. And Bitcoin's the biggest. Uh, Bitcoin has no use case other than um, tax evaders, uh, terrorists, uh, and worse. Oh, I see that. Uh, yeah, and it's, uh, so it'll get to $200 a coin, which is kind of a residual criminal value. Uh, but all this stuff about, you know, $6,000, it's all nonsense. I'm not sure, but I think Doug Cash agrees with your target price. Yeah, okay. So well, I, I think smart guy. I, I'd like to, when it comes to these cryptocurrencies, the cryptos are transactional. So I, uh, I agree very much with Jim. Bitcoin, I don't see the transactional value necessarily well, in Bitcoin. Well, they're not a medium of exchange. But, could but they very well could be because... Could back a fiat currency with, with crypto? It, it is now. It's, it's a dollar. It's crypto now. It's yeah, like the, it's, yeah, the dollar is, a, uh, is an encrypted digital asset. You might have a couple of bucks in your pocket, you know, <laughs> but, but uh, you, you don't really use it. You use credit cards, debit cards, right. direct pay. You pay your bills automatically. The whole Fedwire system is all digital. Has been the last paper treasury note was uh, 1982, I think. So, that, and all that all that message traffic is encrypted. So the dollar is a digital cryptocurrency, which shows that. Uh, but it doesn't have a, a distributed ledger, which is that's the real innovation. That's what makes right. crypto kind of interesting: is the digital distributed ledger, not the the currency itself. And uh, some of them, I think, have a future. Uh, the, the technology definitely has a future. But Bitcoin is a dead end. I mean, Bitcoin's non-scalable, non-sustainable. It's got criminal use cases. Uh, it was the biggest bubble in history, bigger than the Dutch tulip bulbs of the 17th century. It's just sort of a... I think the New York AG just sided against three exchanges, right? Yeah. Or, or at least they're looking into it. Well, that's, right. the, that's the other side. If, if there's no necessarily use for it, um, then, then it can be easily attacked by governments and shut down. So that you want to use for something. For, let's say, for instance, you have a, have a cryptocurrency that, that would be um, used for... Uh, entertainment. You you buy tickets with it. You um, go to sporting events with it. You gamble with it. You, you know if there's a if there's a network of individuals that that transact in that for specific uses, maybe there's maybe there's a, like a dollar. There's uses for it. That's you go to a mall. That's airline miles. That's airline miles. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's, you can go to, that's right. Gift yeah. cards. That, but you can do that with dollars. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you're right. You can do it with Actually, you can't do it with Bitcoin. You, you pay fifty dollars for right. a two dollar cup of coffee. A fifty dollar right. transaction fee. You don't know what right. it's going to cost you in ten minutes. That's exactly. exactly right. Right. There are there are some cryptos that are working with regulators and who are working with banks. I agree. Ripple right. would be an example. Ripple like would Sharky. be an example, right. Now this is a, and I can, I can imagine in the next five years, instead of us doing sterling against the dollar or sterling against yen and doing these kinds of transactions, we'll do sterling versus Ripple. And the reason being, dollar right now is a two-day settlement. With something like Ripple, you could do settlement in seconds. And I think that there's a future there where the guy that's trading spot FX today will be trading spot FX against Ripple in the future, in the next two or three years. So I think that Ripple has a great future because it's right now supported by all the banks and by all the regulators. And it has an elastic monetary base, right? So, so well, if, it, if we take that, if we take that, and you, and you go to the and you go to the block, blockchain ledger, if you take that concept that, that you're discussing, I, I have no problem with it. I agree with it. But you're talking about money. You're talking about transaction, medium of exchange. There has to be something behind it, and that's where I'm going I'm to pull this conversation back to gold. There has to be some sort of reserve asset. The, the, the problem with fiat currencies right now is that they can print as much as they want, you know, digitally yeah. or whatever. They, they just, there's, it's not tied to anything. And so as a result, the value of the money can be um, negated. It can, it, can, it can be destroyed well, over time. It, but and it is destroyed over time. I think time. one of the biggest sales pitches that folks that enjoy Bitcoin talk about is the fact that it's finite. And yet you have a fork, and boom, here's another currency based off of this one. You have another fork, more currency, another fork, more currency. currency. The, the, fact, the fact that it's finite it's, is, it's finite. is actually one of the worst things about Bitcoin, and it shows that really smart developers and really smart engineers don't know anything about monetary economics. 
Because if you understand monetary economics, you don't want hyperinflation, you don't want money everywhere, but the, the money supply has to grow a little bit. As the economy is growing, if the money supply doesn't grow and the economy is growing, that's inherently deflationary. Each coin is going to get you more and more because you've capped it out. Well, if it's deflationary, if you look at, uh, say, the dollar, you know, M0, M1, M2, you know, M3, et cetera, um, what you find is that most of the money in the world isn't really money, it's credit. Credit is what makes the world go around. People borrow, you know, if you have money and I borrow from you and I give you a note and I lend it to Vaz and she gives me a note, all of a sudden it's like $3 around, well, it was really only $1, mm -hmm. we got two notes. But the point is, credit is what makes the money supply expand to go along with the economy. No, who would want to borrow in a deflationary currency? Nobody. Why would you borrow in a currency that's going to cost you more to pay it back, you know, when the loan matures, it, interest aside? So the answer is you're never, apart from a lot of other problems, you're never going to get a credit market to go side by side with the Bitcoin because the Bitcoin is inherently deflationary. That's one thing that Satoshi Nakamoto never thought of. And does so that make the perfect segue for the next topic? Because we're talking about gold, we're talking about the dollar, which has created a unique situation given these this trade atmosphere with China now, because you know it's definitely changed the dollar's dynamic and maybe even gold as a safe haven amid uncertainty with that atmosphere. So gentlemen, is gold still a safe haven? Well, Vladimir Putin and uh, Xi Jinping think so. So uh, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. I mean, why, why would the Russians be buying it but 10, 20 tons a month and the Chinese buying about the same? if it's not a reserve asset. And then you have to take it another level, which is why are they doing that? Oh, you put yourself in Putin's shoes or Xi's shoes, and you look at the United States. The United States looks like an adversary. The United States is getting more aggressive. We're fighting a trade war with China. We're fighting a financial war with Russia behind the scenes through you know, mechanisms like SWIFT and, and elsewhere. Um, and you're like, okay, I gotta get out from under this dollar, because as long as the dollar is king, as long as there's dollar hegemony around the world, and the dollar is 60% of global reserves, 80% of global payments, and almost 100% of the oil market. As long as that's the position of the dollar, you're, a bit, you're, you're enthralled with the dollar. If you're Russia, China, you could hate the United States. But as long as we have the, it's like turning off the oxygen supply to, to someone in intensive care, they're gonna die. If I cut you off from the dollar payment system, you're economically, you're gonna die. They don't like that, so they're looking for an alternative. So what's the alternative? Two things, and I think here's, here's where we can bring the gold and the, the cryptocurrency trends together. First of all, just buying gold. Gold is physical. You get gold, fly it to Moscow, put it in a vault, end of story. The U.S. can't seize it, can't freeze it, can't uh, interdict it, can't kick you out of it. They can't do anything. They cannot erase that gold. It's just there. Okay, but you have to trade. So there's what's emerging, what I call, and I, I briefed the military on this, the uh, a U.S. Army War College and uh, Joint Command down at Norfolk uh, Naval Base recently, and I said, "Okay, just you know, just imagine the following. So, um, uh, so you have this trade. There's what I call the new axis of gold. So, Iran uh, sells oil to China. North Korea sells weapons to Iran. China buys oil from Saudi Arabia. Russia buys infrastructure from China. Russian tourists go to Turkey, etc. These are all the members. So what they could do, they could create their own distributed digital ledger. It wouldn't be Bitcoin. Bitcoin's a joke. But they could come up with their own currency, the Putin coin or the Xi coin. It would be completely encrypted. And all you would do is keep score. It's no different than baseball cards, right? So you keep score all, in this whole trading network. And periodically, monthly, quarterly, once a year, you settle up in gold. And all you do is you put the gold on the pallet, fly it in a plane to the other guy, and he puts it in his vault, end of story. And, and you know, Steve knows better than anyone, when you do things on net instead of gross, it's a much smaller transaction. If you had to pay for everything with gross gold, that's unwieldy. But if you, if you keep score in crypto and then settle up on net, uh, you know, every six months or so, that works fine. Now notice, everything I just said, there's no dollar. And that was Doug's point. Are we looking at the dethroning of the dollar? If we've got gold, Putin's uh, crypto, Xi crypto, um, a distributed ledger, and a large trading network that does not involve dollars, does not involve SWIFT, is that the beginning of the end of the dollar? And it might be. You know, there was a song which is called Rule Britannia, Britannia Rule the Waves. And that goes back to when the UK had the biggest navy. And in general, if you have the largest navy in the world, you control the currency. So the UK had the biggest navy going into World War II. At the end of it, they didn't, the US did and then the dollar came into being and into its, uh, its global dominance. China now is the number one or number two trade partner for not just Asia, but also Latin America. And so China now is turning around to their counterparts, their trading counterparts saying, look, we don't want dollars anymore, just pay us in renminbi, pay us in yuan. That is a huge dynamic change. 
and China now and Russia and Iran and others in Turkey having issues with the United States, realizing that SWIFT is making the dollar into a weapon, can turn around now and say, you know what, we're not going to deal in the dollar anymore. We'll deal in gold and we'll deal in our local currency. And that's the biggest change. And I don't think people really realize that, that it really is the person that owns trade or runs trade that has the largest sphere of influence. So when China now talks at the IMF or they talk at the UN, they can go in there and they can get the votes from all the trading partners and say, you know what, it's better you vote with me than voting with the US. The US has spent a lot of time in the last 10, 15 years looking at the Middle East and fighting wars there, while China's gone around shaking hands and making trade partners. These trade partners now are going to be in China's side when China wants votes at the UN or whether they want votes in any sort of monetary influence. Their sphere of influence has been rising considerably. Their trade's rising considerably. And you know what? They don't want to deal in dollars. And they made it quite plain. That's why you can now trade oil in Chinese currency on the, on the Chinese futures exchange. And it started off being 3%, 5% of the global you know, futures traded. And now that's starting to jump much, much higher. This is a very considerable change. And so I think that certainly you're going to see this dollar dominance fall off. When dollar dominance falls off, people do start shipping in gold and they start looking at their own currencies. And that's the big change we're going through right now. Douglas? I'm oh, sorry. Does, uh, does a president, an administration that fights back on trade accelerate that or well, you know, preserve the U.S. Well, dollar? well let's, let's talk about U.S. trade. When, when he first got in office, you know, Cohn certainly talked about how Trump said, look, let's just print lots of dollars. And, and from day one, this administration has looked for a, a weaker dollar because over the past you know, 20 years, 30 years since Benson, uh, you've, you've looked at being the, the strong dollars in U.S. interest. Well, the strong dollar in the U.S. interest is like sort of investing or, or borrowing in a uh, currency that's uh, deflationary. You know, you, if, if I was to build a plant in the United States today and I'm, and I'm in Japan and I build a plant today and the dollar strengthens by 20% in a year's time, well, that means the employees that I'm hiring in the U.S. will be 20% more expensive in a year's time. Why would I build a plant in the U.S.? The strong dollar stops manufacturers from abroad building things in the United States. Now, why do people build in, let's say, Vietnam? Well, that's because Vietnam, in a year's time, the worker might be 20% less to pay because their currency is weakened versus the U.S. dollar or weakened versus other countries. So when you build a manufacturing plant, you want to build it in a country that's got a currency that's weakening. So if the U.S. can convince folks that, you know what, the U.S. isn't a strong dollar place anymore, we're not really, in, all we want to do now is have a weaker dollar and encourage people to build factories. And what the U.S. has been really good at in the last 20, 30 years is exporting U.S. Treasury bills. That's great. The problem is the U.S. Treasury bill doesn't create a job, doesn't pay taxes, and doesn't get people feeling fulfilled in everyday day life, whereas a manufacturing job does all of these things. And so what I think the, U the U.S. is trying to do now is say, you know what, maybe, maybe we'll buy our own treasuries. <laughs> we'll, have the, right. we'll have the Fed do that. And guess what? What we'll do is we'll, we'll start building up manufacturing plants and convince the world to start building here. Now, the U.S. is in this trade war with China, and it's sort of like, who blinks first? Does the heartland turn around and the farmers say, you know what, you're, you're punishing us too much because we can't sell our soybeans? Well, Trump's turned around and said, you know what, we'll give you money. For, don't worry, soybean farmers. We'll take care of you with the tariffs we're, we're charging on other things. China is dealing with a middle class that's now used to air conditioning and luxury goods, all sorts of different things that now if they were told you can't get this now because it's too expensive, they could turn around and, get, and you know, ask for a regime change in China. So China's up against uh, the possibility of a regime change because the middle class isn't happy because all their American goods or luxury goods are now more expensive. And the U.S. is up against the heartland saying this is costing us too much money, we want our Chinese goods cheaper. One of them is going to buckle. I believe that the buckle will probably happen not in the U.S. but in China, but we're still talking it's a long game. And you have to go through pain because everyone in, in international diplomacy understands that everyone's always bluffing when it comes down to jobs. The U.S. always bluffs with jobs. We'll do this, we'll do that. Everyone knows they won't. And the U.S. has always been turned around and ended up signing an agreement that hasn't been that great. Nowadays, folks look at the U.S. and say, you know what, these guys aren't, bluff aren't, aren't bluffing. They really do want to renegotiate. China was given very favorable terms for trade 20 years ago when we wanted China to start growing. Well, guess what? China's a big boy now, and maybe it's time that they start having more equal trade. And I think that's where we are. So if I could throw in here, it, this conversation started with, is, is gold a safe haven or not? And, and, and both Jim and Doug have, have 
discussed why it, it really still is because it is the reserve asset behind a dollar, behind a one, behind. It's going to be what balances that trade, that global trade. As we go through this this change, I mean, it, it's a, I believe it's a good change. We are going to get manufacturing jobs back here in the U.S. It's already started. We need those jobs. We want those jobs. Well, does that take us down from you know, king dollar, if it does, so be it. It's better for the country, but how does that affect the dollar? Well, it's not gonna matter if the reserve asset for the world is gold, and gold is not manipulated by the United States, China, Russia, it, it's a global phenomenon. So you have gold, and gold is gonna be that reserve asset. At the same time, some point in time, this whole fractional reserve banking that's grown up around gold is going to break, and the physical price, you're, when, you, when China, talks to Russia and says, okay, you know, we bought this much oil from you, we did this and that, okay, send us at the end of the year, at the end of the quarter, whatever it is, like, as I, and I agree with Jim, as Jim suggests, okay, now let's balance. Instead of balancing in, in U.S. dollars or treasuries, now we're gonna balance in gold, and it doesn't have to be all that often, it doesn't have to be whatever, but there's gonna be a balance. So when that occurs, that physical moves. Well, you're not gonna move derivative products. Nobody cares about the derivative product. They care about the derivative product now. They, they care about the derivative product now because it runs that market, because it's tradable. But, it, but that's not going to be the reason for gold. The reason for gold is a reserve asset. So let me, one, one point. So your safe haven, your safe haven asset, if you go to gold now and it's your safe haven asset, you are gonna get the benefit of two things. You're gonna get the benefit of the safe haven because gold has value regardless. And you're gonna get this huge bump in price at some point in time when the, all those derivatives become superfluous and the derivatives outnumber the gold by hundreds to one. Someday, um, the, the longs on the commodity exchange, on the COMEX, are going to stand for delivery. They're going to say, Thank you. here's right. my notice, I'll take physical delivery. There is not nearly enough gold to right. meet that. So the COMEX, and everyone says, oh, you're changing the rules. If you, I've actually enough of a geek. I've read all the rule books of all the exchanges. In every rule book, there's a rule that says we can change the rules. So, uh, you know, the Board of Governors declares an emergency and they can do whatever they want to maintain order. So what they'll do is they'll say, okay, uh, as of now, you can only uh, trade for liquidation. So if you're long, you can be short, short, you can be long. If you're long, you can't stand for delivery. We are not a source of supply. That's a classic quote. And what they'll do is they'll terminate all the agreements at yesterday's price, send you a check. They won't steal your money. They'll give you a check. And you're like, wait a second. At I yesterday's price. At uh, yesterday's. Uh, I right. bought that future because uh, tomorrow, well, too bad, you're closed out. Right. Same thing with the London Bullion Market Association. People think they're dealing in physical gold. I've actually read those contracts as well. Uh, you buy gold. You call JP Morgan London. I want to buy five tons. Okay, done. Sold to you. You read the contract. It's what they call unallocated gold. Meaning I got one bar of gold and I sold it to everyone at the table. And I just hope you all don't show up on the same and day. It's held, it's held and it's helping JP Morgan and, or HSBC. Right, and if, Steve, and if Steve like shows that. up and says, give me my gold, I'll say, well, let me get back to you. No, they do. They're, they're, I've spoken to a lot of people. It takes 30 or more days to actually make the delivery. If five people show up, they terminate they the don't. contract. Right. There's a force majeure clause. You've got to read the fine print. And they'll send everyone a check for yesterday's price. But you will not get the benefit of the bargain going forward. The only person who's going to get that is if you have physical gold, which I would start with Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping. Okay, well, gold, gold, gold. What about silver? Okay, because because year to date, um, gold has been down eight percent. Silver is getting like slapped around. It's down sixteen percent. And then we also had a a few viewer requests on Twitter today about palladium, which I was trying really hard not to say palladium in my mind. So give me credit for that, um, fellas. Let's talk about that real quick for our viewers. Well, the, the separation, separation between, between silver and gold, gold really happened in the last two months or so, right? And I think. The guy to best answer this question is going to be Dave, oh, because no, 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 Dave, no, no, sells, no, no, Dave sells gold <laughs> and silver to the public. So in the last two months, have you seen more calls from the public on silver? You are no. just lucky today. No, no. So, so we have not. We have. We have actually. We deal much more in gold and silver, and the reason is that that our is our um, our customer base. And, and also the reason is, is this, and, and, and this is just in our business, gold and silver are monetary metals, fine. But really gold is, is much more of a monetary metal because of what Jim has described here, you know, China's buying it, Russia, it, it's used as a reserve asset. Silver is not used as a reserve asset. It is a monetary metal, but it's it, over 50% of silver is used in all sorts of industrial production, stuff like that. So silver has a much different, as opposed to gold, which is maybe 2%, I think. It's, it's, it's very, very small. So. So gold is money and a reserve asset. Silver is 
much different. It, it actually much more on the commodity side of things. And so silver has a different, um, uh, it just have a yeah, different dynamic. Isn't okay. silver kind of like the bellwether of the global economy because it's used in stuff? When, when, <laughs> when you look at volatility, generally if you see gold down 5%, you see silver down 8%. So silver seems to do a lot more magnification scale than what gold does. Now, let's say gold was to turn around and go up 50%. Silver might go up 60%, 70%. And I think that that's really just a dynamic of there's a lot more folks trading gold, per se, than there are in silver. And so silver is just a little bit more liquid. And certainly it's an industrial metal as well as being a precious metal. And I think what you'll find is that, you know, certainly as one goes down, silver goes down a little bit more. Gold goes up. Silver could bounce a lot more. So if you're really, really positive on gold, then you'll love silver. silver and it's more affordable for the retail investor. Yeah, they're, they're going to they're gonna tag along the same relationship. Now, people talk about the silver-gold ratio, which I guess is 85 to 1. And um, I say, so what? I mean, that doesn't tell me if silver's cheap or gold's too expensive. And that, that ratio could converge, but it can converge from two different directions. So it has very little predictive value. And when people go back to, it used to be 16 to 1. Well, the 16 to 1, that was the silver mining lobby out west basically bribing the Congress to pass a statute in 1900 saying it was 16 to 1 to increase the demand for silver. There's no inherent ratio. There's no physical output ratio. Uh, those two metals can go wherever they want. But I agree with Doug, over time, they'll trend together, even though that may diverge in the short run. But here's why I like silver. Um, if uh, you know gold is a reserve asset, gold is money, you should have gold and physical gold in your portfolio. Whatever you do, don't put it in a bank. The day you want your gold is the day the banks are going to be closed. There's a conditional correlation between when you really want your gold and, and bank failure. So don't put it in a bank. Put it in safe non-bank storage. But that said, uh, if you want to go out and buy a loaf of bread or some fresh fruit for your family or some cheese from a farmer, gold is too expensive. You're not going to buy $1,000 worth of cheese. And so uh, one ounce silver coins, and there's something from the Treasury. Uh, I'm not a salesman for the Treasury, but there is a thing called a monster box. It's a nice Treasury green. It comes sealed. And there are 500 one ounce silver coins in there. And they cost, you know, depending on the price, eight nine thousand $9,000 or whatever. But to me, that's like... Uh, batteries and a flashlight and water when a hurricane's coming. You want one of those around because you can feed your family. I'm still thinking about $1,000 worth of cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I kind of want that right now with my wine. <laughs> Well, you know, this was such an awesome conversation. I love to tell our viewers you could save wasting your time thinking of conspiracy theories because stuff like this, this is it. This is what's really going on. And I want to thank everyone for coming to Delmonico's to lunch with us today. And whether our viewers like gold or not, they certainly love you guys. Thank you so much again and hope to see you soon on the show.